is um, our life in Christ, our life in the church. And really, in some sense, the two are synonymous, right? Because the church is, is the body of Christ, and so when we partake of the church, we partake of Christ. Um, so today what I want to do is uh, I'm sort of leading into the liturgy, but before I talk about the liturgy in and of itself, um, I wanted to say just a few little sort of introductory comments about it. Um, and the main point I want to make today is that when we look at the Old Testament, right, when we, when we read the Old Testament, hopefully we read the Old Testament, what we really see is we see sort of a prefigurement or, or, or a, a type of what is yet to come, right? We see different things, we hear different things, there are stories we, we hear in the Old Testament, and what we see is that in the New Testament, they're sort of, we might say, fulfilled. They actually happen, like they, they happen sort of in an embryonic sort of way in the Old Testament, but they happen in their fullness, we would say, in the New Testament. And the liturgy is really no different than that, and that's what I wanna, wanna talk about today. Um, so just looking at a few stories from the Old Testament, I'm not sure how well read we are in the Old Testament, but you know, a few good examples of, of sort of images of what was yet to come are, I'm sure we know the story of, of Abraham uh, being visited by the three angels in the book of Genesis, right? And there's an icon, I think, maybe on the wall, actually. Um, and that, the church sees in that a prefigurement of the revelation of the Holy Trinity, right? There were three angels, and Abraham gave them hospitality, and so the church sees in that sort of a, a, a type of what was going to be fully revealed in the New Testament of the Trinity. Um, another example, I'm sure you guys know the story of Abraham being told to offer his son Isaac on the mountain, right, to sacrifice him, right? And of course, what is that an image of? Can anyone think of what an image of that, that, what does that speak to that's completed in the New Testament? Can anyone think of a, what that is? It should be pretty obvious. God sacrificing his son Jesus, right? So that's a, again, and even uh, just in some of the sayings, right, we you see, I believe this is from uh, Malachi, not Malachi, Micah. It says, therefore the Lord shall uh, give you a, a sign, behold the virgin shall conceive, right? So again, we see what is sort of being told in the Old Testament about what is to come, right? So it's, it's, it's one way of looking at it is that uh, some of the fathers, I think, say that it's like the Old Testament is like someone just did a, a pencil sketch of a picture, right? Just a pencil sketch. The New Testament is somebody took that picture with a whole palette of colors and filled it in so that it was radiant and everything was, was evident. Right, so that's, that's how we understand the New Testament um, in relation to the Old Testament. And the same applies uh, in, in our worship, really. Maybe you know this, maybe you don't. But Jewish worship had sort of two parts to it. It had um, the temple, did I write the answers here? I guess I did. Uh, it had the temple and it had the synagogue. Does anyone know what happened in the temple? Can somebody tell me what happened in the temple? And how was it different than the synagogue? Anyone know? Pleasure? Sacrifice, exactly. So in the temple, really, if you went to the temple, you know, you brought a, a turtle dove or, or a sheep or a ram or an oxen. It was, it was all about sacrifice. And there was only one temple, right? So right now, there, ain't no, there is no temple, right? If you're a Jew, there's no temple to go to because the temple's not active. Um, but that's what it was about. It was about sacrifice. It was about offering. You bring, you know, your whatever animal, you bring your grain offering. But it was all about sacrifice. It was about sacrifice. Uh, and really, with that, it was about the shedding of blood because that's how the sacrifice was offered, right? The ram... You know, the priest would take the ram and he would slit its throat and then it would open it up and it would, you know, disembowel it and all of these things. Um, what was the synagogue? The synagogue, exactly. The synagogue was really more um, about reading the scriptures, mainly the Torah, which means basically Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, which were the main books of the Old Testament for a good Jew. Um, but it was the reading of that and the teaching of that. And of course, are there synagogues that are still active today? 
Of course, right? Because they're not, they're not specific to a location. The temple was one place, and there ain't no other temple. And so if there's going to be temple worship, it's got to be there in Jerusalem. But the synagogue can be anywhere, right? And so that's how the Old Testament worship was. It was sort of divided in, in these two components, which very interestingly is a lot like the divine liturgy. In fact, arguably, it's kind of the same thing. It just looks a little different. Right? So there are two parts to the liturgy. Have you guys heard of the liturgy of the word as opposed to the liturgy of the faithful? Did I read that? So the liturgy, does anyone know what the liturgy of the word is and like where it begins and where it ends? Anyone know? We just did it. So it starts, we're going to say that. Like into the gospel. So exactly. It starts at... You know, Evloimeni Vasilia, blessed is the kingdom. So when the liturgy starts, that's, when, that's the beginning of the liturgy of the word. And it actually, technically, it ends at the sermon. Because the sermon, so it, the epistle is read, the gospel is read, and then the sermon is preached. Although not everybody preaches after the gospel, but I do. Um, and that closes the liturgy of the word. And of course, what is it about? What's the point of the liturgy of the word? It's, it's, it's didactic, right? It's educational. The point of the word, uh, liturgy of the word is to teach, to, to reveal to us God's revelation, right? Kind of like, kind of like what in the Jewish worship, kind of like the synagogue, right? And as soon as the liturgy of the word ends, which is basically right after the sermon on uh, Sunday here, we begin the liturgy of the faithful. Now, what is the liturgy of the faithful? What's what is that? Do we know what that is? The liturgy of the faithful. We're going to say Eleni. Come on, Anthony. Hold on. Two Elenis here. Um, Exactly. And actually, do you know why it's called the Liturgy of the Faithful? It's called the Liturgy of the Faithful because, at least back in the day, only the faithful were allowed to be present during that part of the service. So as soon as the Liturgy of the Word ended, anyone that wasn't Orthodox actually had to leave. And it kind of made sense. The reason was because they didn't want someone who wasn't Orthodox to sort of accidentally come up, right, and receive communion. And, and it, it would... It, the liturgy of the, of, of the faithful, in some sense, doesn't really have anything for someone who isn't Orthodox. Because the only point of the liturgy of the faithful is receiving Holy Communion, right? And again, in the same way that the liturgy of the Word is about teaching and learning, you know, the, the, the God's revelation, um, as the synagogue was in the Old Testament, right? The, the liturgy of the faithful, right, which is about... Holy Communion, right? The, the priest consecrates the bread and the wine, it becomes the body and blood, and then, of course, we partake of it. That is the sacrifice, right? So the liturgy really is, in some sense, the synagogue and the temple put together, but in the New Testament, right? In the, in the revelation now of, of the Messiah. Now, we, we have the Messiah, right? We, the Jews were waiting for the Messiah, but we are not waiting for the Messiah anymore. We have the, the Messiah. He came... And he revealed himself to us, right? And this is just, I thought, was a, a little kind of thing to think about. So when we look at, like, Old Testament worship, if you look on the sheet there, Old Testament worship kept having new sacrifices. You have to bring another lamb, and another lamb, and an oxen, and a new oxen, and another oxen, and then another lamb, right? There was no end. But in the New Testament, there's only one sacrifice, and it was done, and it's never to be repeated. And it was Christ's sacrifice on the cross. And we don't redo that. We partake of that event. So when we celebrate liturgy, it's not like I'm re-crucifying and re-sacrificing Christ. That's not what's happening. What's happening is we are literally partaking of that event 2,000 years ago. In some sense, we exit time, right? We enter into God's time. And then God's time takes us right back into the upper room where Christ and the disciples were, and Christ said, eat of this, drink of this, this is my body, this is my blood, right? So, in the Old Testament there were many, but now it's done. There's only one completed sacrifice, and that's what we partake of. Um, in the Old Testament there was a lot of blood, right? I mean, you can imagine all these temple sacrifices. Some people said it was like, it was like, uh, you know, one of these, like, slaughter. I mean, it was just constant, man. You can only imagine how much blood and gore there was, because that's what they did. But for us now, that's changed. It's been completed in Christ, and there's no blood. It's bloodless, right? We offer the bread and the wine, and it becomes the body and blood of Christ. Um, and then, of course, for the synagogue, right? They were waiting for the Messiah of the Jews, but we are not waiting for the Messiah. We have the Messiah. So when we preach, we don't preach the Old Testament, although sometimes we bring that in. 
we preach the New Testament because the Messiah has come, right? We're not waiting anymore. We have. And so we hear the epistle. We hear the gospel. We hear about what Christ taught. We hear about St. Paul's explanation of what Christ meant, what he did, right? And so that's the difference. And so now we've, we've entered into this old, we, we've exited the Old Testament and entered now into this New Testament. And that's where we are. That is how we worship. But, and maybe the reason for all of this is to say that we're not disconnected. Right? There is a connection. There's, there's, there was a progression right? from the Old Testament to the New Testament. It wasn't as like there's no correlation or no relation. There is, but, but we simply are the completion of it. We are the, the, the fullness of what was sort of not complete and not full in the Old Testament. So that's my lesson for today. Um, a few quick things. Uh, Deacon Peter, can you come out here for a second? So... Um, so this, uh, Deacon Peter uh, Kavasik, right? Okay. 